Thank you so much for having me. It is such an honor to be here. I'm actually so, so excited to be here. Like Brandy said, I am family, essentially. So Brandy, let me, let me make this. Let's see if I can figure this out. So my cousin's son married Brandy's sister. So in our Indian culture, that basically makes us blood. So that's, that's how that works. Am I right, Christine? <laughs> it's like... Yeah, in our Indian culture, that makes you blood. So that's awesome. And then Pastor Nancy and I have found we've had several connections that date back to the 90s, which is crazy. So you guys are family. So I'm super excited to be here. Like Brandy said, my name is Karen Harmon. (laughs) And if you're wondering why a little brown girl has such a vanilla last name, because everyone always wonders that. I don't know if we have a picture. Do we have a picture? It's because... I married a six foot two redhead from Nebraska. So I'll let you have a minute because I know it's a little shocking. (laughs) But we have three kids. Abby is now 16 and towers me, which doesn't say much, but she's 16. Sophie is 12. And our little guy, Aiden, he will be five next week. And he's super excited that he's like a full hand. So... That's super, super fun for him. And like she said, I'm, I mainly stay home and homeschool um, them. And then I also work as a physical therapist. I own my own practice. But one thing I love is I am a fan, a huge fan, a huge supporter of the local church. And I love my local church. And I love serving in my local church. And I do serve on the worship team there. I oversee several small groups. And I help to lead some leadership classes and write and speak as well. But there is nothing better than serving the Lord in his house. Amen. So that is one of my most favorite things to do. As Brandy and I were talking about tonight and kind of muddling through what tonight may look like. And she was like, well, what do you have on your heart? What is the Lord kind of stirring in you? And I had this picture that I saw a while ago, and it was of this beautiful woman, and she was dressed in like a wedding gown, okay? So just picture that beautiful woman dressed in a wedding gown. And she's got her foot up on a step, and she's lacing up some combat boots in this beautiful wedding dress, lacing up these combat boots with a sword leaning up against that bench and with a word of God open on that bench. And that was a picture that I was reminded of that I had seen somewhere in my past. And I told Brandy, I was like, I just have this picture of like a warrior bride or a warrior princess, something like that. And she said, oh, well, the artwork that we had, I guess it was up here earlier, but that we had, it's actually titled Warrior Girl, which is like so awesome. So ladies, the Lord sees you and he has a specific word for you tonight. And then on top of that, we started talking a little bit more in Ephesians 2.10 had come up as kind of the theme for the night, and that was a verse that I had been meditating on as well for you. So the Lord has you here. Yes, see? I don't know whether to start rebuking demons or welcome the presence of God. We'll go with both. (laughs) But the Lord has something for you tonight. Okay, just going to make sure. You are here on purpose and for a purpose. And he sees you specifically. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open to Ephesians 2, or open your app as the kids do these days. And I can barely see. I just turned 46 a few days ago, so just forgive me because I just went ahead and printed it out in like size 20 font (laughs) so that I could see (laughs) All right, Ephesians 2, I'm going to start in verse 3, and we're going to go all the way to verse 10, and this is in the New Living Translation. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, I'm so grateful for that but, but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. That even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. Because it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. 
So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. Amen. And you can't take credit for this because it's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so none of us can boast about it. And here is our verse for the night. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. Amen. In different versions, we're also called his workmanship. We're called his handiwork, depending on the version that you have. And growing up, the last thing I thought of myself was a masterpiece. Do we have that picture of me as a little girl? Yeah, you're welcome. I blame Sarah for this. My friend Sarah over here in the front row, we went to grade school together and she was cleaning out a closet. She's like, look what I found. I'm like, that didn't need to be found. (laughs) But here I am showing it to all of you. So this is actually when I was in second grade. Now that little girl did not feel like a masterpiece. That little girl woke up every day feeling very ugly. That little girl woke up every day feeling less than. That little girl woke up every day being the only brown girl in a sea of white and feeling very, very, very different than everybody else. That little brown girl didn't feel like she was ever enough. She didn't feel bold. She didn't feel brave. She definitely didn't feel beautiful. And I think many of us still carry some of that little girl in us. And like me, I know many of us have experienced times when the last thing that we felt like is a beautiful and priceless masterpiece. Maybe you're currently in that season and you don't feel bold or brave or beautiful. Life has beaten you down. The hits keep coming. But friend, I want to encourage you tonight that there's a father our Savior, who can turn your ashes into beauty, if you will let him. Amen. So as we go through tonight and what the Holy Spirit has laid on my heart to share with you today, I pray that you see yourself the way the Creator has intended you to see yourself. And that is as a beautiful masterpiece that he created specifically to do good work. So what is a masterpiece? Let's start there. The word masterpiece is defined as a work of outstanding artistry, skill, or workmanship. A masterpiece can be considered an artist or a scientist's greatest work. And according to Ephesians, you are God's masterpiece. You are his greatest work. A masterpiece actually says something about the artist as well as the art itself. How many of you know that we serve a God who is the greatest artist of all time? (laughs) Amen. I know sometimes that's hard to see living in Texas. We should go to Colorado every now and then. I met someone here that was from Colorado. Who was that earlier? There you are. Yeah. God's masterpiece shines through where you're from, for sure. But here's the thing, ladies. Until we know how beautiful and unique and bold and brave that he made us, Until we know who we are in him, it's going to be hard for us to actually believe it ourselves, that he sees us that way. That's how he sees us. And I said this earlier, that phrase, bold and beautiful, that that kind of came into play. And I know for those of us that may be a little bit of an older generation, there was a um, soap opera (laughs) called The Bold and the Beautiful. I mean, I don't know any of that because I'm godly and I I don't watch that stuff. Um, (laughs) But I know when I said that title that some of you thought, okay, that's what this is going to be about. Like, no, no, no. But I, I, I just find it kind of fun to play with those words. But as I was thinking of that phrase, I was reminded of the story of Abigail in the Bible. And her story is found in 1 Samuel 25. I'm not going to read it all to you. And I'm a little partial to this story because my firstborn is named Abigail. And I just love, love, love who she represents. But I'll give you a quick little synopsis of the story of Abigail in my non-theological way. <laughs> So here we go. Abigail was married to a man named Nabal, all right? Nabal was what the Bible says was a surly and mean man. So he was very evil, okay? He was not kind. He was harsh. 
just not a good guy. But 1 Samuel 25 actually tells us that Abigail was very beautiful and very intelligent. Well, in that time, David, yes, that David, him and his men were out in the wilderness, and they were kind of around the same place where Nabal's guys were, tending sheep and taking care of their their herd and all of that stuff. So during that time, David provided protection, took care of Nabal's men, kind of gave them food, just kind of looked out for them, all of that stuff. So David and his guys kind of just watched over Nabal's herd and all of that. So one day, David was like, you know, I kind of want, I'd like some food. I like some meat. You know, I'll just ask Nabal. Surely he'll do that for me for all that I've done for him. Surely. So David's servants go over to Nabal's, and they say, hey, Nabal, you know, David would love if you could just give us some bread, some meat, just something, you know. And Nabal, because he was so awful, was like, no. No. Who do you think you are, David? I'm not giving you jack squat. So David's servants go back to David, and David's like, that's it. He gets his sword, puts it in his, and he's like, let's roll. They're all dying. They're all going down. Who does he think he is, right? So they load up. They're rolling out. Well, Nabal's servants, the wise men and women that they are, thought, if we're going to get anything done, we should probably go to the woman of the house. They're not dumb. So they go to Abigail, and they're like, you got to do something, because Nabal's lost it. Nabal's losing his mind. This is what happened. And Abigail's like, oh, no, 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 we can't do this. So she gathers up figs, she gathers up bread, she gathers up meat, she gathers up all the things. She puts it on donkeys, and they go out, and they meet David halfway. And she falls on the ground in humbleness, in generosity, asking for forgiveness, and presents all this amazing stuff to David, okay? David sees her bravery her boldness, because in those days, women did not present themselves that way in front of the presence of men. He sees that, and his heart softens, and he decides not to kill Nabal. Now, God gets his revenge on Nabal anyway, but that's a whole other story. (laughs) The whole point of this is that Abigail was so brave, and she was so bold, she ended up saving the lives of several people. She was a culture shaper who displayed kindness and generosity, although her husband displayed the opposite. She was also a woman of action. She was servant-hearted. She was wise. She was humble. And ladies, you were also created with such amazing qualities. Our creator's handiwork, his workmanship, his masterpiece to do good works in the world around you. You were created just like Abigail. So what exactly makes a piece of art or work of science a masterpiece? I'm a little bit of a nerd, so I like to do research. And so I looked up, like, what makes a masterpiece a masterpiece, right? And what popped up was this doctor. His name's Dr. Joseph Goldstein. He's actually just down the road here at UT Southwestern, which happens to be my alma mater. (laughs) Woo-woo. Nerd people don't have a woo-woo. We don't have that at UT Southwestern. I'm totally just making that up. (laughs) Anyway, he wrote a paper and gave a speech in 2018, and this is what he said makes a masterpiece. He said, the first is that a masterpiece is so original that it overwhelms us with its power, okay? It's treasured. The second is that it stands the test of time. Masterpieces are timeless. The third is that it changes the way generations of artists and scientists think about their field. Masterpieces are transformational, They're game changers. And what's so cool, and I want you to see this, is that Goldstein's observations of what a masterpiece is actually echoes three characteristics of the way that God created you as his masterpiece and what he sees in Ephesians 2. So watch this. This is so cool, and this is the nerdy side of me. Okay, so Goldstein, he said in his carnality. Okay. A masterpiece is so original, it overwhelms us with its power. This is what verse four says in Ephesians two. God loves us so much. You're treasured. This is what masterpiece says, or what Goldstein said about a masterpiece, that it stands the test of time. Ephesians two, five to six says that as a follower of Jesus Christ, you are seated in heavenly realms with him for eternity. You are timeless as a follower of Christ. All right, so here's the third thing. Goldstein said that a masterpiece changes the way generations of artists and scientists think about their field. What does verse 10 say? 
that you were created to do good works. You were created to be transformational. You guys, the world can't tell us any new truth that hasn't already been established in the word of God. So the world can come up with all this research and it's like it's already all there in the word of God. That's exactly how God sees you. You are treasured, you are timeless, and you are transformational. So let's break that down. I'm going to change the order a little bit. So first, masterpieces are timeless. They're classic. They stand the test of time regardless of the current fad or trend. They stay true to what they are. They're unwavering whether the storms of cultural popularity, cancellations, pandemics, elections, global leaders. <laughs> the Mona Lisa is still the Mona Lisa. That's right. The Sistine Chapel is still the Sistine Chapel. That's right. But why? Why do masterpieces stand the test of time? Because masterpieces have a unique identity that never changes. So I went to the experts. I'm going to quote a fashion stylist. This is what she says about a timeless person, okay? A timeless person has a self-identity that doesn't change depending on what's currently popular. That's what makes a timeless person. So I'm going to give you the, the spiritual definition of that. A timeless woman is grounded in the word of God and who God says that she is. A timeless person knows where her eternity lies. She knows that she cannot move forward effectively without learning to stand still in his presence first. And Brandy mentioned this verse, in his presence is fullness of joy, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. Because ladies, we can't go and be effective Marthas and go and do all of the things for the glory of God without being a devoted Mary and be willing to sit at his feet first. That is where identity lies is at his feet. Like masterpieces, you are unique and you are original. There was no one like you. And that should be celebrated. All right, I want to look at Psalm 139, verse 14. I'm going to read this out of the New King James. It tells us that we were intricately knit together in our mother's womb. It says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. The Hebrew word, and for any theologians in the room, I apologize ahead of time because my Hebrew, who am I kidding? I don't even know Hebrew. I was going to say my Hebrew is rusty, but I don't even know Hebrew. So this is what the word, the Hebrew word for fearfully is, yare. It doesn't mean being afraid. It actually means with great reverence, heartfelt interest, and deep respect. That's how you were created. The Hebrew word for wonderfully is palah. And it means created in unique and marvelous ways, set apart. So let's put that together. You are created with deep respect and reverence in a unique and marvelous way to be set apart. You were specifically designed for such a time as this. You know, I kind of shared earlier about my story of not fitting in and feeling like I didn't belong and that kind of carried into growing up and, and even into motherhood. Like, I never felt like I fit in into the, the stay-at-home mom world. I didn't fit into the working mom world. I just didn't feel like I ever fit in, even growing up and even sometimes now. <laughs> I sometimes don't. And so what I learned to do growing up is I would just change and shift and become whoever I needed to become depending on the environment that I was in. And that became my identity instead of my identity being in who God says that I am. Being confident in who you are and how he made you, created you, formed you, helps you stand the test of time. Right. Hardships and trials in life, they'll come, but the fact that we're grounded in who Christ says we are helps us navigate whatever it is that the enemy throws our way. Remembering who we are in Christ helps us navigate the test of time. And I'm going to have them put this up about examples of what it means to have an identity in Christ. And I want you guys to screenshot that. Because I know sometimes when the enemy attacks, it's hard to remember who we are. So put this on your phone. Look up those scriptures. Write it on the mirror in your bathroom, wherever you need to. If you are having a hard time knowing who you are in Christ, remember this is what he says about you. All right? All right. You're timeless. Number two, masterpieces are treasured. Like masterpieces, you 
are treasured. You're loved, you are valued, and you have value. Hear that. The Lord tells us in Isaiah 43, 4, he says, you are precious and honored in my sight. Ephesians 2, 4 says that God loves us so much. I think of the woman at the well. You know, Jesus had this amazing way of valuing women. And we know the story in John 4, and there's all these sermons that are preached about it. But one thing I love about it is she was the Samaritan woman, and Jesus was a Jew. And in those days, Jews did not talk to Samaritans, much less a Samaritan woman, much less a woman the way that she lived, right? But that didn't stop Jesus from asking her for water. That did not stop Jesus from revealing himself to her as the Messiah. Another time Jesus valued women was when he first rose from the grave. Who did he show up to first? Who saw him first? Mary. And Jesus valued her so much that he told her to go tell the greatest news of all time that he had risen. That's how much he valued her. Not because she was a big gossip and she could go tell all the world because she was going to go blab about it like some preachers have said. No, no, no. Jesus valued her as a woman and that time period, which is even crazier because in those days women were not valued. So if you hear anything tonight, ladies, know that he values you. And he demonstrated that time and time again when he was here on earth. A masterpiece is valuable in and of itself. It does not have to do anything to prove its worth. Its very existence, your very existence, declares your value. You are intricately and artistically and specifically formed. Our creator loves you so much that he gave his life for you. Ephesians says that we're saved by grace for good works. We're not saved by works for grace. We were saved by grace. That's it. The enemy will do whatever he can to make you feel that you're not valued, that you aren't treasured by Father God. He will whisper lies to you that you're not good enough, that you're too broken, that you're bruised, you're beaten, you're not worthy, you've done too much, you've gone too far. But hear me, let me tell you, there is no distance too far, there is no pit too dirty, and there is no ocean too deep where he will not meet you, where he will not love you, where he will not show you how valuable you are. So whatever it is that the enemy is whispering is a bunch of lies from the pit of hell because you are valued, you are loved, you are worthy, you are his masterpiece. You are precious in his sight. You are his treasured possession. He values you. He cares for you. Your value isn't determined by your resume or the bio in your social media profile, or the number of followers or likes that you have, the kind of car that you drive, the house that you have, how much money you have, no one cares. That's not, that's not what values you. Your value is determined by a Savior who is willing to die on the cross for you. You're priceless. You know, I want to speak to some of the older women in the room. We live in a culture that sometimes undervalues age. For some reason, our culture throws us away a little bit or doesn't see us as relevant anymore the older we get. When in other cultures, it's actually revered the older you get. There's a lot of respect. In ours, and even in the church, unfortunately, older women are kind of cast aside. You kind of reach a limit, and you're like, oh, my goodness. And, and I'm going to be honest. I have been feeling this way. Um, I've been serving on our worship team for about 19 years. <laughs> the other day, I was up there, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, I could be your mama and your mama pretty sure I could be your grandma. Um, (laughs) Pretty sure I changed your diaper. Um, But yeah, it it was a little jarring, right, to be the oldest one. I I turned 46 a couple days ago, and I know that's still a baby to some of you, and to some of you are like, oh my gosh, you're practically one foot in the grave. Um, (laughs) Just kidding. But I had a moment where I was like, man, I'm up here with all these 20-somethings. Like, what am I doing? Is it time to kind of bow out gracefully? You know, am I one of those people that just keeps trying too hard? Like, she can't let it go. Like, Karen, let it go. It's time to move on. Let it go. And I remember the Lord like, no, you're not done yet. And so for the more mature women in the room, I want to remind you of Titus 2, where we're commissioned 
to be mentors to that younger generation. You still have value. You still have worth. You still have something to give. Do not bow out. And I'll get fired up about that, but I'm going to leave it alone. (laughs) Younger women, I haven't forgot you. Is it 1 Timothy 4.12 that says, do not despise your youth, right? You are valued too. Don't let the enemy tell you that you're too young to make a difference, that you're too young to know any better, that you're too young to be used. You're not. He's gifted you and specifically called you for certain things, and you're not too young to do it. So don't let him lie to you that way either. We're, we're all needed, guys. Regardless of what age or stage, season or reason, situation or circumstance you find yourself in, you are valued, you have worth, you have a purpose, you have a gifting and a calling to be used for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Uh, my, my, I have a ministry friend, her name is Bianca Altoff, and I was listening to a podcast that she was doing the other day, and she said, if you're not dead, you're not done. I was like, I'm going to use that. If you're not dead, you're not done. All right? All right. You're treasured. Third characteristic of a masterpiece. They are transformational. They're game changers. They're culture shapers. They improve the environment that they're in. They're able to produce a big change in that environment. Goldstein said that masterpieces change the way generations think about their field. You are a legacy-forming culture shaper created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So what mark do you want to leave on the world? What legacy do you want to leave? What gifts, talents, callings do you have on your life that you can use for his glory? What do you want to change in the world around you for the better? One of my favorite verses is 1 Peter 4.10. And um, I have, I think I gave them to read from verses 8 to 11, if I, if I did. But I actually am just going to read this part of it. I'm going to read 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Christ Jesus. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Use your gifts, ladies, whatever they are. A woman I greatly admire in the Bible for using her callings and her gifts well is actually Lydia, and her story is found in Acts 16. I think it's verses like 11 to 15, I think, yeah. And um, I won't read it all to you, but basically, story time again. Lydia was a woman. She was a businesswoman. She did purple cloth. That's what her business was, and she lived in Philippi when Paul and Silas got there. But she was actually from a city called Thyatira. Bible words are hard. (laughs) Thyatira. Okay. I'm coming back, guys. ADD moment. So that's where Lydia was from. But what was so neat is like Thyatira was known for their purple dye. So Thyatira and purple dye were kind of like what New York City and fashion are to us, okay? And that's kind of what Lydia's business was. She was a very, very wealthy businesswoman. That's what she did. But she showed incredible hospitality by inviting Paul and Silas to stay at her home after she accepted Christ. And some theologians say that Lydia actually visited Paul and Silas while they were in prison, and that her home was actually the very first place that the European church ever met. Lydia was a Christ-following, wealthy, smart businesswoman who also showed hospitality and generosity to Paul and Silas, and she hosted church in her own home. Y'all, she was transformational. She left a legacy. The European church met in her home, and she wasn't in full-time ministry. I'll let that stay right there. You don't have to be a wealthy businesswoman like Lydia, to make a difference. Use whatever is in your hands right now. If it's staying home and changing endless diapers and providing endless meals, do it. If it's working inside or outside of the home, then do it with all your heart for the Lord and not for men. If it's mentoring young women, keep going. If it's going back to school, starting a ministry or a business or finally writing that book 
do it. If it's educating your kids at home, do it. If it's starting a support group for women, if it's starting a support group for widows or for women who've lost babies or a grief support group, do it. If it's simply being more present in your marriage and for your family, then do it. What is in your hands right now? How can you be transformational? The enemy will do whatever he can to keep you from fulfilling the good works that you were created to, but don't let him have his way. Several years ago, our church um, started a group or called, started a class called Women in Leadership Development, and the acronym is WILD, which is kind of funny. But back in the day when they first started this class, it was by invitation only. So a pastor or a leader had to see something in you and invite you. I was never invited. And year and year went by, every year went by, and I watched everyone around me get invited to this leadership development class, but I never got invited. But I had a burning desire to do more for the Lord. Like I felt like there was something else in me, and I wanted to learn more and to grow more, and I didn't understand why they didn't see this quality in me. It was really devastating. It was very hurtful. At the time, I was working as a physical therapist at a clinic, and I was serving on the worship team at our church, and we had a women's conference one weekend, and one of the speakers had just had a knee surgery. And so she asked one of our pastors, do you know any physical therapists in the area that can work on my knee while I'm here, just had the surgery? So our pastor was like, oh, yeah, there's a girl on our worship team that's actually a PT. So I ended up working on this speaker's knees. Fast forward a couple years after that, I was asked to be on the worship team for a nationally touring women's conference called Women of Faith, and this same speaker was one of the speakers that toured with us. She came to me a few years later uh, from that tour and was like, hey, I'm starting this ministry for women called Propel Women, and I'd love for you to be a part of it. Can you please write for our newsletter? Could you come and speak and on our panel for our live events? And this woman had no idea if I could put two words together, much less put me in front of a thousand people <laughs> like I could say something. She, she took a big chance on me. But y'all, and honestly, that's what propelled me literally to do what I'm doing now. And that led to more speaking engagements and all sorts of different things. And I wouldn't be standing here right now doing this and, and sharing the heart of the Lord for you guys if I had not been faithful in where he had me as a PT, serving my local house in worship. I could have taken that church hurt from them not seeing me and run with that. And I don't know where I'd be. Or I could be intentional in where he had me in that moment. I had to finish that current assignment. Because he wasn't going to allow me to advance or move forward till I finished that current assignment. So friend, don't focus so much on the future outcome that it deters your present obedience. There are people on the other side of your obedience. Don't waste what he has brought you from and what he has taken you through. Be a game changer. Be a culture shaper. Like a great masterpiece does, what mark do you want to leave on the world? You have something to offer. You're gifted. You're called. There's something that you do. You're valued. Yes. Be bold in those specific callings and those unique giftings that he's put on your life. And don't you dare compare to Su Susie's That's right. or Judy's, <laughs> Sally's. <laughs> They're yours, not hers. It's a new day. From here on out, I want you to leave a beautiful legacy of God's handiwork in and through your life. Because many times the ugliest hardships of life become the most beautiful victories of our lives. And your stories matter. And I'm going to share you a story that was, that was transformational for me. And I know several of you have probably heard this story before, but I will not stop sharing the goodness of God in my life. Amen. And maybe one day I'll get through this without tears, but that day's not today. Um, <laughs> I, I show the picture of my family earlier. Five years ago, I found out I was un unexpectedly pregnant at the age of 40. So that was fun. <laughs> it was actually a really, really good pregnancy. Um, I had a really healthy pregnancy. I felt good the first two trimesters. And about the third trimester, I started having some weird pain in my right hip. And it ended up leading to an excruciating amount of pain where I couldn't walk. 
I ended up being diagnosed with a very, very rare condition that only happens in four of every one million pregnancies. Wow. It only happens in, women's in, their tw in women in their 20s and 30s, and it only happens to women that are usually on their very first pregnancies. I didn't fit any of that criteria. <laughs> But basically, there was swelling in the bone marrow of my femur that was causing so much pressure in the bone that it was producing these little cracks in the ball part of my femur, that ball and socket. So there was just, I mean, it was just excruciating. It was awful. So the prognosis that I was given was that I may be able to walk six to nine months after I deliver, but there was no guarantee that I would walk normal again. Y'all, as a physical therapist, that's not good for business. <laughs> as a mom, that's not good. As a person, that was not good. That was not what I wanted to hear. I went through a season, and I'm not proud of this, but I'm going to be honest with you. I went through a season of being so angry with God. And I used to judge people that would get angry with God. <laughs> like, how can you be angry with God? And here I was, so mad that he would allow this to happen to me. I did a lot of questioning. I was like, why, why would you give me all these opportunities? I had like eight or nine speaking engagements lined up that year. Why would you give me all these opportunities, open all these doors just to shut them in my face? And then I may not walk normal again. What on earth? And I was meeting with a pastor friend, and he's older and so sweet. And he said, you know, Karen, he's like, if you believe what Romans 8 says, that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord, then you will not just praise him when you get through it. You will praise him while you're in the midst of it. And to take it a step further, you will praise him for it. And I was like, hold on. Praise you for it? Are you kidding me, old man? I may not have said it like that. But I was like, why not? I have nothing else to do. I can't move. I'm in a lot of pain. I'll try anything at this point. None of the medication's working. Why not? I praise you. I praise you. And the more I said it and the more I did it, the more it sunk into my heart. So fast forward, what, what they told me was um, they only, there was only like 20 case studies in the world at the time of my condition. And if you try to deliver vaginally, then you typically sustain more damage in your hip, is what would happen. And so they scheduled a C-section. Well, I went into labor two weeks early. <laughs> and by the time I got to the hospital, it was too late for a C-section, and it was too late for pain medication. So I delivered him vaginally with a broken hip with no pain meds. <laughs> Ouch is right. Whoever <laughs> just said that. <laughs> Yep, that's about how it went. But y'all, the Lord has shown me so much through that. He has literally changed my life. My relationship with him is like it has never been before. I feel so close to him. I feel so much more passionate about sharing the hope that we have in Jesus. I'm so much more grateful for who he is, not just for what he's done. What the enemy meant to destroy you, God will use to restore you. but you gotta let him. You never know what God can do in and through you when you decide to be grateful and praise him despite what's right in front of you. And I know that's hard. You may still see yourself as that ugly duckling like I did as a little girl, but my prayer is that after tonight, when you look in the mirror now, you will see yourself the way God sees you, a beautiful masterpiece. You are timeless because you know your identity in Christ. You know who you are and where your eternity lies. You're treasured because you know you're loved and you know that you're valued. You're transformational because you know your mission to use your gifts and your callings and your story for the glory of God and to advance his kingdom. You're called to transform the world around you. If the worship team could come up, that would be great while I try to fix this makeup. 
And ladies, I want to close your eyes. We're not going to pray quite yet, but what I want to do is I want you to close your eyes so you don't get distracted by what's going on around you. The Lord had given me something, this was kind of last minute, um, that I want to speak over you as we close. So if you'll just close your eyes, and Holy Spirit, I just ask that you will help them to hear what they're supposed to hear and leave what it is that they don't need to hear. But ladies, our Creator has made you strong and capable. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, but I know some of us don't feel strong. You're weary. Maybe some of you know what you need to do, but the weight of that calling feels a little much, and you're battling insecurity. Some came tonight brokenhearted, insecure, worried, anxious, battling fear. Some are facing financial struggles, relationship or marriage woes. Maybe your husband is going through a lot. I know mine is right now at work. Some are facing health struggles. I'm right there with you in that category. Some of you feel lost. You need direction or an answer or a touch from the Lord. You long to hear his voice. Maybe some of you are lonely or hopeless and maybe even thought of ending your own life. Please don't. Please don't. Please stay. Friend, I want you to know there is a father who loves you so much. There is a savior who longs to be your friend. The Holy Spirit is waiting to help guide you. Maybe you want to know this Jesus we keep talking about. There's going to be women here who want to pray with you and help you. And I'll be down here as well and would love to pray with you. Ladies, you may feel battle-weary, but you are not broken. So as Pastor Nancy comes up, I want to speak the scripture over you. And if you're comfortable, you're more than welcome to raise your hands with your palms up to receive it. If you don't, that's fine too. I don't, whatever is, is comfortable for you. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, ladies, I want you to look up to me now. I want you to hear this last thing. You are his masterpiece, saved by grace, made new in Christ to go and do good works. Amen?